The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Media Services, the City of Oshkosh, or Time Warner Cable. Hi everybody, welcome to Ian Oshkosh, Cheryl Hentz here and very pleased to be joined by someone that I think is going to be a very popular guest, but maybe for different reasons. I'm <laughs> pleased to welcome Tom Buchholz to the show. He is a professional engineer and project manager with the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. Uh, he's here to talk about uh, the road construction projects going on in our area. His area of expertise is primarily uh, the US 41 project, so we're going to focus mostly on that. We're also going to be touching on roundabouts and uh, kind of the best ways to navigate in them, probably the only ways that you should be navigating in a roundabout, why they're safer than other types of intersections and so forth. And hopefully he'll have a little bit of at least general information for us on some of the other construction projects in the area. So anyway, that being said, welcome. Thanks Thank you. for coming Thank down from Green Bay tonight to be here for us. Um, well, let's start out with, you know, <laughs> the, the big thing that I'm sure you're hearing about no matter where you drive. You see road closures, detour signs, orange barrels, and a lot of frustrated drivers. <laughs> there yeah. seems to be road construction everywhere you go around Oshkosh. How did it end up that there are so many projects going on all at once? Well, part of the 41 project is such a big project. It's a $515 million project. So that in itself is a beast in itself. And as, as best we can, we try to do planning. Uh, and for the most part, we have of trying to get other projects done before 41 work, 41 work gets started. And 41 has started with, you know, the County K overpass, 20th Avenue, Witzel, working on Washburn. But the really the 41 work really hasn't started yet. So, you know, the stuff that's going on with Jackson Murdoch, there's going to be some resurfacing on 76. Some of the other main arterials is going to get done here in calendar 10 before the real big bang on 41 is going to start later this fall and certainly in 2011 and 12 when there's just going to be a lot of tra construction traffic on 41. It's so you're telling us that this is nothing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if, you wow. think, if you think this is uh, frustrating, uh, next year is going to be, you know, prepare. Next year, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And we, we tried to plan to get those other projects done. So then, then the roads are at least clear on some of those other arterials. So then if you want to avoid 41, you'll have 76 done. You'll have Witzel done. You'll have 20th that you can avoid some of the things on, on 41. So, yeah, get ready. Well, you know, the 41 project, I, I get that that's so big and, and a multi-year project, um, you know, to say the least. But then all the other stuff that they're working on, and I know it's out of your area of expertise, but, you know, the Jackson Murdoch roundabout and the Main Street Road reconstruction, um, you know, all these things, it just, and the bridges being out, you know, um, bridges being the overpasses, mm -hmm. um, you know, it just seems like it, you really have to figure out and plan before you head out somewhere how to get from point A to point B. Did they have to do all those things at the same time? Uh, part of it is just the way it worked out in the program. Jackson and Murdoch, we actually wanted it done in 09 and just due to certain things, it goes through the process as you develop the project. There's, you know, doing the design, planning to move ut uh, utilities, uh, buying real estate, that stuff all kind of takes time. And if those things don't go as exactly as scheduled, then things get delayed. Jackson and Murdoch, you know, originally we wanted done in 09, things just didn't work out, so it got done in 10. Main Street has been, we thought, from perspective, that was far enough off 41 that, yeah, it's a big project straight downtown, but it's far enough that, it, you know, the impacts, 
you know, are far enough away, and that was pretty much always scheduled for 10, and that stayed on schedule. Jackson Murdoch is the one that's was slipped in the schedule. We wanted that done in 09, but uh, it turned out. So it's complicated a little bit, but that'll be done here in July. So it, yeah. once that's over, it should be a little bit less. Than okay, all right. Well, and I suppose when you're dealing with something as big as the 41 project, because it is so many years, you can't delay the other stuff right. for that many years yeah. either. So I, I guess it stands to reason, but I'm still frustrated yeah. like everybody else. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And, it, you know, you had to navigate through all that oh, yeah. coming down tonight from Green Bay. Yeah, so. Absolutely. Anyway, um, well, let's, let's talk about some of the specifics with regard to 41 because, you know, I've, I've had folks from the DOT on over mm -hmm. the course of the last few years talking about different things with regard to this project. And still, in other places, you know, the newspapers talked about it, radios talked about it. Uh, I know it's been brought up at city council meetings, and, and yet people still, I think, are confused. Um, well, I know some people are because, you know, they, they talk to me about this stuff, and they're just like, what's happening again? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think people understand the number of roundabouts that there are going to be along 41. So let's kind of dissect this sure. a little bit, Tom, and really lay it out for folks. Um, Let's go with the widening itself. How yeah. many lanes are going to be on each side of the highway? Yep. Uh, right now, currently, it's two lanes in each direction. When we're done, we're actually going to have three lanes in each direction. Okay. And the project starts south of 26 okay. uh, and then goes up to Breezewood Lane. So it's a, a distance of 17 miles. And primarily, most of that widening is all to the center. Okay. Uh, the median's wide enough that ultimately we can fit the additional lanes in the center. We're rebuilding all new pavement. Everything's going to be brand new. So that 17 mile encompasses the main line of the project. And then with that, uh, certain interchanges we're completely reconstructing. So 9th, 21, 45, and Breezewood are the four interchanges we're really completely reconstructing from new. And then 26 was rebuilt in 2000, 2001, so really minor improvements. 44 was built in the early 90s, very minor improvements on there, doing some ramp work. And then 76, we're doing some uh, ramp improvement right now. It'll be three months, very minor type stuff uh, compared to the big picture. So really, uh, you know, four complete reconstruct interchanges and then three sort of modifications. Uh, and then with that, on those interchanges that we're rebuilding completely, we've made the decision to go to roundabouts. So ninth will end up having four, uh, the two at the ramps, and then the two at ninth and, or one at ninth and Washburn and ninth and Keller, so four total. Uh, Witzel will have two. Uh, 21 will have four, uh, the 45 interchange will have two, and then Breeze will have four. So 16 total with the 41 project, and then if you count Jackson and Murdoch, it's 17 total that we'll have uh, in Winnebago County. People don't like the idea of these roundabouts at all. <laughs> you know, <laughs> some do, but there's so many people who just can't stand the idea of it. And, you know, even after they're in and they've been in for a year or two, they'll, some people will probably still be complaining. But a little bit later on, we want to actually um, kind of look at a diagram of a roundabout. Sure. And um, now, are they all going to have the same kind of configuration or will that be different too? Because how you navigate in these is, that's kind of dependent on the design of the roundabout. Right, roundabouts are very unique. Um, uh, and they're, they're different than that we typically treat our intersections in the sense that each roundabout there isn't sort of a cookie cutter design that you apply to each one you really look at the traffic and the traffic movements and then we do projections 20 years out and say okay what is the traffic going to be in 20 years and then design the roundabout in such a way that you can handle that traffic out 20 years so some roundabouts um, we'll have uh, what we call right turn bypass lane. As they approach, there'll be an exclusive right to make a right that you don't even have to do uh, to get into the roundabout. Uh, some won't. Um, but the ones that the 16 that we're involved with, all because of the volume of traffic, will all be multi lane roundabouts. So there'll be at least two lane approaches. Um, the ones at 21 on the ramps will be a little bit larger. They'll have maybe have three, uh, three lanes in one leg of the roundabout. But, but generally, they're all going to be. Uh, multi-lane, two-lane in each direction, and a lot of them be very similar. So uh, from a driver's perspective, uh, an example, the ones at 9th aren't really going to be any different than the ones at, uh, at Witzel. They're going to be very similar. So if you learn how to drive Witzels, when those are open later in 2010, when 9th Avenue gets opened up in 2011, uh, the driving will be very similar because the roundabouts will be somewhat similar. The signing is what you need to pay attention, as you said. As you approach the roundabout, pay attention to the signing.
Yeah. Well, and you know, and the, I mean, I've driven in roundabouts before. I'm not an expert at it. I'm kind of getting the hang of it. Mm -hmm. I think I probably already have the hang of it, at least the ones that I've driven mm -hmm. in. Um, but you know, there's so much to look at. I, I think that's probably the the most confusing thing because as you approach this thing, first of all, it's something you're not familiar with, and so you're trying to kind of eyeball it mm -hmm. and seeing what's what and then you're trying to look at a sign to see what you're supposed to do and you don't want to impede traffic by stopping or yeah. slowing down too much to look at a sign there's a lot of things to really consider as you approach these things and I think that's where people are probably going to get hung up the most right and it's and the one key thing to kind of what we when we do our honor about our outreach it's very similar to a inter any intersection if you're going to turn left at any intersection you're in the left lane at a roundabout no different. If you're going to be turning right, you're in the right lane. So that sort of intuition, depending where you're going, already uh, tells you where you need to be. If you want to go left, be in the left lane. Now, certain roundabouts, um, if you're in the left lane, you can go straight and left, and that's where paying attention to the signing as you approach them. Um, generally, the ones we're going to have at Witzel and at Ninth, you can go left and go straight in the left lane. So it's pay attention to that signing as you approach it and gen what we're going to have it will be signs over overhead signs it won't be on a ground mount post side it'll be over the lane which will will tell you if you're in the correct lane or not and you know generally these uh, in the Oshkosh area are going to be people that are going to use them day after day after day so just once you get through them people are going to learn okay this is my route this is the lane I need to be in and and generally when we've done roundabout out outreach already you know certain people I just want to get east west I, I'm not trying to get in the highway then just stay in the right lane and you can go straight through and it'll be very simple for you so it's gonna be a learning process but pay attention to the signs and we'll be fine yeah well we'll, we'll touch on that um, a little bit more specifically later but you know one thing that I just happened to think about as you were talking you know so many people have GPS's in their cars these days mm -hmm. um, they're gonna probably have to pay to have those <laughs> maps updated um, once these roundabouts are done, won't they? Because otherwise, that GPS isn't gonna, you know, it's that GPS isn't gonna know what to tell you to do or where to go. I'm not familiar with all the new software, but I imagine that's gonna complicate things yeah. once they're in a little bit. It should still say it's stay left. You know, if you're coming on Keller and you want to go on to 41, it'll say take a left on Ninth Avenue. It isn't gonna matter whether mm. there's a traffic signal or roundabout. You still gotta take the left. Uh, Magellan and Garmin and, and whoever <laughs> else make GPS units may see a huge <laughs> increase in in their map updates. Um, <laughs> once all this gets done. Well, let's talk some more about um, 41 then, Tom. Now, when it comes to the Lake Butamore Bridge itself, um, that's been a fascinating thing yeah. to watch, you know, how you actually fill in part of a lake. Right. You know, that's, that's been really interesting to see. But will there at any time be a complete closure of that bridge? No, we're going to okay. build it in s stages. Um, so we can stage traffic. This whole 41 project, when we went in, we, we knew the volumes going in and everybody travels it when there's a crash, when there's an incident, or when there's any minor ma maintenance work done during the daytime, we get three to five mile backup. So when we walked in, we said, we gotta be able to build this project while keeping two lanes in each direction. So that's been the focus going in, uh, the work that's already started in 09 and continued in 10, there's been nighttime lane closure. So when we need a lane uh, to to do something, um, we've had nighttime lane closures. We're trying to keep the, the 41 open during peak time. So as we build the causeways, as we build the rest of it, it's really maintaining two lanes in each direction as we build it. There will be some nighttime lane closures, um, 41 closures when we do when we drop the bridges down. An example, when we did Witzel Avenue and we did 20th Avenue, we actually closed 41 to allow the contractor basically drop the bridge right on the highway. So we had night detours where we send traffic on the frontage roads for three to four nights between like 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. So then there's a full closure of 41 at that time, but it's usually off peak time when the, when the peak travel is lower. So okay. generally as we build the causeway, there really shouldn't be any closures per se, um, unless we get some huge incident, somebody runs out of gas, flat tire, fender bender, those could yeah. cause some backups. But as part of the construction project, it should keep flowing uh, as we build it. Somebody um, who's a boater asked me to ask you this. Will there be, as the bridge itself is reconstructed, will there be any impact to boaters on Lake Butamore? Um, a common question we also get, I'll answer that one if uh, people may know, is the, the bridge clearance on the main span. Is that we're we changing that? No, we're maintain, maintaining the same navigational clearance for the boaters underneath on 41. 
um, as we build it because we're actually nowadays we can uh, have our bridges span much longer distance there's going to be a less number of piers in the water so the new piers compared to the old piers will be staggered per se so we're going to end up having sort of a a boater traffic control to try to go guide boats through the the work zone as a <laughs> boater. Um, so there's going to be times when that's going to be an issue. Um, we're just people are just going to have to be aware. Currently, when you go under there, it's a no wake zone, or it's supposed to be. So people have to slow down and pay attention. Okay, where do they want me to be? Sort of avoid because there'll be there'll be barges, there'll be cranes on barges, there'll be construction equipment around, and, and we're going to have to work it out. We're going to have to maintain, you know a free channel at some point to get people through. So uh, long answer there uh, that I've said, but in the end, it really shouldn't have an impact to boaters per se. When we take the old bridges down, which will generally be during the weekdays, um, you know, then we're going to have some issues with, you know, making sure we don't have boaters under there when we don't want a loose piece of concrete falling on a boater where they may be slowing boats for a while as they do a certain operational work. Um, but generally, it shouldn't happen. Uh, example, um, for boaters, when we rebuilt Wisconsin Street, we had to take the old bridge down and work with that and really worked with them, uh, with boaters, and try to notify the marinas, hey, this is when we're going to have some blasting or some removal or something, and, and notify them, say, hey, you may want to avoid it. But generally, it was done during a week time when the boating traffic wasn't as high. You know, obviously, on a weekend, the boat traffic is very high, so you try to avoid right. that. So no real snags, just mm -hmm. um, a, a period of time where they're going to have to be a little right. bit more cognizant. And of we'll try what to get doing. we'll get notice out through you know marinas and stuff if that is the case. Uh, you know if somebody comes on a vacation for a week and go on a boating trip, you know we'll try to hopefully they get the notice from through their marina that say hey, you know there might be a little delay. Maybe you want to change it by a day or leave a little earlier by a day, that type of thing. Sure. Um, how You mentioned it before, and I, I didn't catch it. What is the total cost of the US-41 project? $515 million, and that includes the design, uh, the real estate, the cost to move utilities, and construction costs. So it's, it's a lot of things. It's a big number, but um, yeah. That's, that's a huge number. Between that and the 41 project we have in Brown County, it's by far the largest construction project in Northeast Wisconsin yeah. we've ever had. Is there any part of this $515 million number, Tom, that um, will be absorbed by um, the taxpayers right in Oshkosh or Nina or Menasha or Winnebago County as a whole, or is this all state? Uh, generally, it's all federal, state funded. There are some certain uh, aspects of the work, very, very minor, that uh, that we do an agreement with the city of Oshkosh or with the city of Nina. Generally, those are the two entities. Like, if there's uh, utilities, an example is we're going to do some utility work on Ninth Avenue that only makes sense to do it when Ninth Avenue is closed, so there isn't traffic there. So the city is going to do some some uh, utility work outside, say, the project limit area and they're going to do it with our project. So what we set an agreement, say, yeah, that makes sense because we don't want to do it when traffic's there. We'll do it then, but then there's agreement, say, okay, you pay that amount. So generally there, there is, but compared to the 550 mil 15 million, very, very small number. Okay, all right. Well, there's some good news. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we may not like the road construction <laughs> and, the, and the detours and so forth, but not going to cost us anything, really. Um, when I had someone from the DOT on, um, I don't remember exactly when, I want to say probably about two years or so ago. I specifically asked them as part of this project if there would be a time when there would be um, an on and off ramp at Witzel Avenue uh, to 41. And I was told yes, there was going to be. But now in talking with you before we started taping tonight, that is not in fact the case at all. Right. It will still be as it's always been. Correct. It'll be an overpass, no access to 41. And the main reason there is, one, Witzel is so close to 9th Avenue, time you got exit ramps on and off, they'd actually be touching and they just don't meet design standards. So from, you know, access on and off would be just way too close to 9th Avenue. Okay. All right. Anything, I, I know we've just grazed the surface here, but hopefully we've put some information out there on, on the 41 project that, um, that, that people, you know, will hopefully benefit from. I know, I'm just thinking about something else here. Now, the bridges on 20th and Witzel that have been down for, you know, six weeks or eight weeks now, um, when will those be done? Uh, 20th Avenue, uh, scheduled in June. Um, they poured the deck almost two weeks ago. So uh, it, they're ahead of schedule at this point. Okay. So I'm guessing it'll be probably early June. That's speculation. We could get, you know, bad weather, but 
Um, generally, they're making good progress. So I would f the goal was to have it open before Country USA. That's in our contract deadline. I fully expect they're going to meet that. Hopefully, they can actually get it done in early June. Um, Witzel Avenue is supposed to be open September 2nd before okay. Labor Day. That's what's in the contract document. And then what we have is a, a pretty good sized penalty if the contractor doesn't meet those dates. So uh, I'm expecting that they'll get that September 2nd, hopefully. So 20th Street for sure by the time EAA yeah. rolls around at the end of July. Um, I mean, unless there's just major, major problems. And uh, Witzel, um, that won't be done for any of these things, but right. should be done by Labor Day. Yep. Okay. All right. Anything else then uh, with respect to the 41 project that well, you'd like folks to know? Sure. Just uh, from a safety perspective, you know, we'll talk about roundabouts later, but from a safety perspective that people may or may not know is that we're going to actually light across Lake Butamore. There will be lighting on the highway. Uh, and there's been studies proven nationwide that when you light highways, they're much safer because people can see a whole lot better. So there's going to be lighting uh, across Lake Butamore and into the 45 interchange. They'll actually be lighting at the exit ramps. So, you know, when there's adverse weather a little bit, there's a little fog, a little rain, a little snow, um, the exit ramps will be lit. So that will help with driver and driver safety. Um, the other thing that people may or may not know is the 45 interchange because of the large volume of traffic going north on 45 to northern Wisconsin. We're actually going to have a third level flyover bridge to carry that volume of traffic. So everybody knows in Oshkosh on Friday nights when it's basically May to October, it backs up on Friday nights and yeah. the Sheriff's Department has to run the signal so we don't you know, minimize the backups in the freeway. Well, there'll be a third level bridge. People never have to stop. They'll just exit and keep going 60 miles an hour onto 45 and away they go up north. So. And then the same will be true reversing the other way when they come south on 45. They won't have to slow down or stop. They can go 60 miles an hour and merge okay. right onto 45, which will be a huge safety you know, improvement to what we have today. Okay. Speaking of 45, I don't know if, if the DOT was responsible for this or if the, the blame should go somewhere else, but why did all these highway names change? You know, 45 is now what the old 110 mm -hmm. used to be. Um, Jackson Street used to be 45. Now it's, um, what is it, 76? 76. Um, I always kind of get that one confused with 96 up in Appleton, but it's 76 now. Why did they do that? In 2003, we actually changed that as part of the Highway 10 construction from Stevens Point to Appleton. That opened, and then the 110 opened the four lanes. And it was really, you know, if you look on a map and see the, the most direct route for the highway, there were people that were using the old 110 to W to Hi County Highway D to New London mm -hmm. to get their way up north, and that was the most direct route. So it really made sense to make 45, because those people were all getting to the Eagle River area was to make that change and that name change to be the most direct route on the highway. So yeah, back in 2003, DOT led that sort of effort and that uh, and went to the communities and that everybody agreed. It was confusing, still confusing to some people, but you know, if you look on a map, it's the most direct route and made some sense from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we were the ones responsible. All <laughs> right. Well, you don't get my vote for that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit, if you, to the extent that you can, okay. about the Main Street Road reconstruction. Sure. Um, you know, when will that be done? Do you have some? Yeah, uh, November. It's planned for uh, okay. November completion. Um, there is uh, a scheduled p completion from uh, the Fox River Bridge to CP. They want to get that connection in May, uh, get that first leg to open up traffic ac across the bridge and into you know, the area where Waterfest is so people can get across the lake. So there's a schedule at mid-May, but the entire project on the limits is November. Okay. All right. Let's, we're running out of time, so I want to touch on roundabouts. Um, you know, this, the first one that we're going to have a chance to really drive on is going to be the, the uh, Jackson and, and Murdoch one. Um, you've said that'll probably be open by, uh, let me look at my notes here. I thought I wrote it down. Uh, sometime in July, Early I think July. you said, right? Yep. So, um, you know, we're going to have a chance to, to kind of drive it. And, you know, I, I know you guys have done a lot of outreach on this and education things already. And, you know, we've had people on talking about it. And there's been, you know, written publication stuff about it, too. But I think until you're actually there, it's, you know, there's something that doesn't compute mm -hmm. until you're right there starting to drive on it. But we've got a, a really nice diagram here, if we can kind of take a look at it. And, and maybe as you're looking at this, I don't know if we can maybe zoom in a little tighter on that at all. Um, but maybe you can sort of show us 
um, you know, is, is this right here, is this indicative of what we're going to be seeing at like 9th and, um, you know, 20th Street and um, Oshkosh Avenue? Yeah, this is a multi-lane roundabout and um, looks like it. some of the lefts are exclusive lefts. Uh, if you look at the, the legger, the intersection as you approach, say from the bottom of page north, that left lane is a left only lane. Um, and you can tell that by the pavement marking and the sign. But generally, they're going to be multi-laners uh, that we're going to encounter. And um, yeah, they're going to be very similar to all this. And you know, that, that looks, to, to just look at that, it, it does look kind of simple. Um, as you were talking about earlier, if you're going to be turning left, um, you, you want to be in your left lane as you approach this. Um, whereas if you're getting off on the very next road, it looks like you'd have to be in your right lane. Um, and, and so then you just follow, say you're going to be turning left, you would just follow that around. Um, now at some point when you need to get off, are you going to have to get in your right lane? No. Or, okay. No. Well, so basically uh, roundabouts, what we say is get in the proper lane prior to the intersection. You should not have to change lanes within the roundabout. Um, you should not have to do that. So. Um, you pay attention to the signing as you approach, uh, choose the proper lane, and then there's actually a crosswalk um, that pedestrians may be at, and that's generally 20 feet back of the, the, the yield line. And the reason is, the state statute is that you're supposed to stop to a pedestrian in there, whether it's marked or not. So we basically, what we have is say, if there's a pedestrian there, you need to stop for the pedestrian. Then you pull ahead, and then you go to the yield line, and at the yield line, then in a roundabout, you really only have to look left. You know, it simplifies the driving task at that point. You look left, and if there is a gap, then you can take the gap. Now, what we have found and what you see is that people's willingness to go into a roundabout at first, they don't want anybody else in the roundabout <laughs> before they get in. And what you see later is that people's willingness to accept a much smaller gap uh, gets less and less. So people will actually you know, pull in right behind you know, a bumper very close. The roundabouts that I travel in the valley, you see that more and more, they just people get used to driving them and they take a, a much smaller gap. And then you just basically stay in that lane and then exit where you need to exit. Um, it's, just, it's simplified behavior, or simplified driving behavior a little bit, but it, you, it, it isn't as simple as what we're used to where you basically wait for a green light, okay, now I can go. Right. But what we typically, what we show at our, our, a lot of our roundabout out outreach is somebody r running uh, a red light and crashing into a vehicle. Somebody just saw a green, didn't check left, somebody runs a red light and there's a T-bone crash. You know, so that's what we show and say this is why we're doing roundabouts because the design of the roundabouts, generally people are only going to go be going you know, 18 to 25 miles an hour. So if we do have a crash, it's a non-injury crash, it's a non-fatality, it's a fender bender, it's mm -hmm. fixing bumpers, it's fixing fenders, much, much less. Um, the roundabouts that we've seen in northeast Wisconsin, we have like the multi-lane one in De Pere that's opened. Um, crash rates really haven't gone down. Uh, they stayed the same as prior, uh, but the, fatal the fatalities have gone down. We don't see those, and the, and the injury crashes have gone way down, generally 60, 60 70 percent. So from a DOT's perspective, you know, one of our main goals is safety, and they're just proven to be much, much safer, and they move just a lot of traffic. The one in De Pere, if people are uh, familiar with it, it would back up every AM rush. It would be back half mile in the signal world, and now what's happened is it's five, six cars deep, and then right now we have a project on the 172 project. Uh, they're doing a bridge project, so it's handling double the traffic we ever thought it would, and it's handling it very well, very, very well. So, you know, the, where we have multi-lane roundabouts, they're performing, the crash rates as far as, generally the same, but the, the injuries are way down and they're moving a lot of traffic. So, uh, you know, I don't expect anything different with the, you know, the 17 that we're gonna have in Winnebago County with okay. 41 in Jackson Murdoch. And of course, from a pedestrian standpoint, the, the benefit is you only have to look one way at a time. Correct. So, and there's a there's an island in the middle, so it actually offers you a place of refuge to stop when you make a yield. You know, at a, a bigger signalized intersection, you have to cross four lanes of traffic. It takes right. much longer to walk across four versus two, uh, so it just complicates it more uh, and longer. So, from a pedestrian standpoint, they've proven safer as well. 
All right, excellent. Well, very good. Thanks so much for being here and helping to clear some of this stuff sure. up. I appreciate it so much. Just sit tight, and we're going to take a real short break. When we come back, um, State Representative Gordon Hintz will be here to talk about the recent legislative session. So we'll be right back. Dear Mom and Dad, well, I finally have some time off, so I'm writing to tell you that I'm doing well. We have good days and bad days over here. We try to remember the good ones and get through the bad ones. Mostly we have each other, and that's what keeps us going. And Mom, since you asked, if anyone wants to help, just tell them to contact the USO. You can't believe how much they do for us. With love, your son, Michael. Every year, the U.S. Department of the Treasury receives about 1.4 million reports of problems with paper checks. Checks can be lost, stolen, or delayed. If you still receive Social Security payments by paper check, Treasury wants you to know about a safer, more convenient way to get your money. The Direct Express Prepaid Debit MasterCard. The Direct Express card is new and is available to anyone receiving Social Security benefits, even if you don't have a bank account. Your monthly benefits will be automatically placed onto your card account each month on the day your money is due. While other debit cards cost money, it is possible to use the Direct Express card for free to make purchases, pay bills, and get cash at thousands of locations nationwide. There are no sign-up or monthly account fees. No more waiting for the mail or worrying about lost or stolen checks. Call 1-877-212-9991 or visit www.usdirectexpress.com. We were in an emergency situation. We don't have extra. We have a little bit of water and a little bit of food. A meeting no. place, no. No. I don't think we have a first aid kit. We have tuna fish, we have right. beans, we so. have um, um, canned beans. tomatoes, true. you know. That's true, but that's uh, really not survival food. Tomato we, paste. Yeah, well, oh. yeah, right? And welcome back to the second half of Ayan Oshkosh. And as promised, Gordon Hintz is here, fresh from the um, steps of the state capitol, uh, pretty much. <laughs> fresh as, fresh, as, uh, fresh as you can be. Last week was uh, kind of a, a grueling week for you. Uh, yeah, um, you know, a long session. I mean, I think we you know, began things with the economy sort of um, already in uh, you know, economic downturn and creating, you know, really difficult decisions on the state budget and, uh, you know, a lot of other big issues. But I think overall we were able to, um, you know, address a lot of long-standing issues that we, you know, previous legislators had, uh, legislatures had been able to get done and I think do some positive stuff that's hopefully going to make the economic turnaround come quicker. Yeah. Well, one of the things, um, you know, and, and we'll start here because this was really kind of your baby, mm -hmm. was the, um, you know, the, the payday legislation. Um, and it didn't get passed quite in the format that you had originally proposed it, but, you know, maybe we can talk a little bit about what was lost in the process and what was eventually passed and how folks are going to benefit from that. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously I uh, have a lot of mixed feelings about the overall experience, but, you know, really relieved and happy that the legislature did take action. Um, this was something that I had sort of made a priority last year after a number of incidences where, you know, we've told the stories on here. I think most people know someone or have heard of someone who's been taken advantage, not just by, um, you know, triple-digit interest rates, but by a system that sort of sets you up to fail by lending you more money than you can reasonably pay back, um, getting you hooked in on a contract that continues to you only pay the interest, never pay off the principal. And, you know, the more we looked into this, you saw that about $150 million a year is given to high-cost credit um, around the state, and 90% of it comes after, um, you know, people roll these things over. So uh, we had proposed a rate cap, um, you know, got a lot of bipartisan support for it, uh, but, you know, the industry had 31 registered lobbyists um, on auto title loans, payday loans, um, you know, and there was also, though, some uh, people in the economy saying, you know, economists saying, you know, access to credit is incredibly difficult right now. Uh, banks and credit unions simply aren't lending to people in need, and how do you balance these issues? So there was certainly some political opposition. There was also some pl uh, policy reality of where we are, but 
those of us that worked on it were always committed to making sure that we reined in the most abusive practices, um, not lending people more money they could reasonably pay back. And so the final bill does have um, an overall total limit of 35% of your gross monthly income. So no matter what, with interest, with fees, with the loan, it can never exceed that amount. If it's going to be a short-term loan, small dollar loan, you know, that, that's going to be the maximum you can get. And so you won't have stories of people who um, are paying $3,500 on a $500 loan. Um, that's significant. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also uh, one loan at a time, you know, up to that amount. So uh, we'll have a database that will give us data on how many people are chronically using it. You know, there's all the privacy protections in the world in there. Um, but, you know, limiting it to one loan at a time, limiting it to an income test, um, are significant, and those were things that we really worked for. The, the biggest fight that we had at the end of the day with the Senate, and we kind of rolled the dice on the <laughs> final week, was to include auto title lending, which I thought we banned in the assembly altogether. Iowa has it banned, Minnesota has strong protections. Um, we ended up getting it regulated, but uh, you know, it really is a practice where someone's not just risking their financial well-being, they're potentially risking losing their means of transportation, which is there for employment. Um, you know, I, I learned a lot uh, through this whole experience, but this is something that they've been debating for 10 years in Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, I realize the significance of getting it done, and at the time that we're filming this, looking forward to the governor um, signing it. Do you know when he will be signing that? No, I know the bill, uh, when there's amendments and changes, it gets engrossed, and it was just done so um, yesterday or today. So he has to kind of go through it. Um, and uh, but, but I'm sure I'm sure I'll be there. And of course, we taped this. Uh, we're, we're taping this on on May sixth. So um, yesterday or today being May fifth or May sixth. So um, yeah, you'll you'll be there front and center with him. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I think a lot of people, you know, it's probably not exactly how I would have designed it, but it has elements that I've said have been important all along. And you know, to me, it's the beginning place. You know, I've been sort of torn between oh, you know it's not good enough or it's too strong or, you know, and, and I think it's because of what it accomplishes, it's so much of an improvement that it is a significant accomplishment. I think um, going forward, you know, if we continue to see them circumvent, you know, certain, um, you know, or, or do practices that we think take advantage of people, um, we'll address those as we come. But uh, everybody needs to understand it's not just the people involved that take a hit, it's communities, it's mm -hmm. businesses. Um, overall, it's bad for the economy when people are spending money on things like high cost credit uh, instead of consumer goods in your community, instead of on rent. You know, we had the Apartment Association, in fact, Mike Mokler came down and testified um, in Madison in support of uh, the rate cap bill. Hmm. So. Okay. Well, you know, and you talk about um, the auto title aspect of this. Um, I've told this story before, probably when you were on, but, um, you know, as, as a reporter, I remember um, really being horrified one day. I was covering a, um, a bond hearing uh, for someone. Um, and it was a it was a criminal case, but of course you know those those things you're sitting in the court commissioner's chambers, and it, there's just a ton of other cases that probably come before yeah. what you're there for, and one after another after another were um, what they call uh, replevins, uh, which are auto repossessions, yeah. and they were from places where you had to put up your car title as collateral and these folks just simply couldn't pay the loan. And I, I bet you there were 15 different auto repossessions in just that afternoon. I, I was shocked. And I've heard if you go to auctions, a lot of the people selling the cars at sort of auctions are cars that have been repossessed. <laughs> and you know, we have no idea in Wisconsin how many cars are repossessed, how many cars are sold, yeah. um, because it was totally unregulated. Uh, we were able to get the beginnings of things, but not to the extent that, that I would like. But, um, you know, the other thing is we also offer a 0% repayment plan. You know, the goal was to, to help people get out of these messes. But throughout the process, I've learned, I've talked to, um, you know, attorneys. I've talked to credit counselors. I've talked to mediators. I've talked to bill collectors and all these people in the process that have sort of been able to shine light on um, you know, an industry and an experience that we, we don't often hear a lot about, but also just to understand how it actually works. You know, we kept getting the spin from the industry that people love our product and they you know, need this money and 
Um, that was not what we were hearing from consumers and other people um, in there. And, and it was really a model that sets people up to fail. And um, you know, I'm glad we got a start on it. So even though there were some concessions made, um, you know, when you look at what you had originally proposed, how is the um, you know the industry themselves um, looking at this now? I mean, obviously they're probably not happy, but you know there has to be give and take, I guess, in most things. And um, you've given, and and uh, you know they've given. Are have you heard from them? Are they? I mean, they just wanted <laughs> this to go away completely. They did, although they wanted to. You know, part of the reason you see legislation change sometimes is because they know it's a way to kill it. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, I said I wasn't going to pass anything or sign or get behind anything that didn't include auto title a lot because I didn't want to regulate uh, payday loans and then have these places just switch to a uh, bigger market for auto title loans because I think that's more dangerous. So um, we you know, maintained a commitment to do both. Uh, that risked the whole bill, uh, but at the end of the day, the Senate came around. So, um, you know, the industry probably is you know, happy that they didn't have a rate cap because most of them would have gone out of business. Um, at the same time, I doubt we're going to have 542 of them in Wisconsin, nor do we need 542 no. of them in Wisconsin or 13 in Oshkosh anymore. Um, it's simply, you know, the, the majority of their profits come from, uh, you know, really getting people hooked when you can make, you know, $3,000 on a $500 loan. Okay. Um, another measure that was passed, and, and um, I, I've got mixed feelings about this. Mostly they go in the opposite direction of where probably a lot of people are, are you know, looking at this. But um, it was a, um, uh, a measure that basically outlaws uh, texting while you're driving. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand there's a lot of kids out there who text while they drive, but, uh, and some adults too. Um, but the way I'm looking at this, Gordon, is it's, it's some feel-good legislation because how do you really, we've already heard from officers saying, eh, we're probably not going to be writing a whole lot of tickets. Um, and how do you prove that someone was actually texting and not dialing a phone or whatever? I, I mean, it just seems like do all or nothing but even if you did it all and just said no cell phone use while yeah. driving unless you're on a hands-free method of operation even if you did that why not just use the old inattentive driving thing and be done with it you'd have a way of catching more people and making it stick mm -hmm. You know? I, I, I don't disagree, and I've had plenty of friends say, well, are you going to ban putting on makeup in your car next, or are you <laughs> going to ban, uh, you, know, ba you know, I don't know, banging your head while you're listening to music next? I mean, it all falls under inattentive driving, and you're correct. I mean, the enforcement of this um, seems next to impossible when I imagine driving to medicine, and I've had to sort of coach my own self um, on this. But this is one of those things that we've seen a rise in accidents related to um, texting or, you know, um, using the web on your phone while driving um, and while um, maybe this won't prevent people from doing it, it's really the generation I think that's growing up with cell phones that maybe uh, never knew what it was like to not drive with them that by going through driver's education and everything else send the message to them that you know this can be as dangerous as drinking and driving. It's you know, by, by making it illegal but you know I would agree you know that's the major positive as I see it and I would agree that um, enforcement makes it, you know, it's something that we know what they've been able to use in intended driving when there's an accident by looking back at, you know, phone records and things to see what they were doing. You know, we've pieced together accident information. So um, I'm not going to be uh, campaigning on that one, but um, I understood and, um, you know, some people made a bigger deal out of it. Yeah. Well, and, and the thing is, you know, according to this um, uh, the thing that I pulled from the Northwestern's website when Governor Doyle signed the law the other day, um, the law does not cover reading text messages or browsing the Internet if you have a smartphone uh, where you can pull up the Internet on it. So it doesn't cover those things. So in order to really enforce this, you've got to, like you said, gather up phone records and like, sort of piece everything together. Well, that's, that's time-consuming. That's costly. It's, you know, it's resources being used that could be used somewhere else. Whereas if you just nailed them for inattentive driving, boom, that's it. You don't have to go through all this extraneous stuff. And I didn't sit on the committee that held the hearings on, you know, a lot of these bills come out and you're not sure why they look the way they do in terms of details, but um, 
Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, uh, I think one of the bigger issues is how we're going to deal with this. I mean, some, uh, you know, uh, research groups and others have said, you know, cars are going to be made in the future with devices that block your ability to use phones because simply that's what we're going to have to do um, because it is such a problem. We're having more and more accidents related to people on their phones or driving. When I did a ride along with the county sheriff, we were on 41 trying to report to an accident. We sat in the passing lane for two minutes and they're like they're on their phone and we had the lights on and the siren on and they were just talking on the phone we could not get to the scene um, and that's when it really becomes a problem so I think you're gonna see some of these incremental dinky measures that attempt to s stress the seriousness of it but I think you will see um, technologies that come out that you know when the vehicles moving uh, won't allow you to text or drive or cut your signal and of course you're gonna have people that you know want to be able to do that so uh, we'll have to see, but I always use this as an example in schools of this is a problem we didn't have 20 years ago or 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, I, I, I don't know if we'd ever see legislation actually pass um, that, well, I don't know if you need legislation to pass, but it seems like uh, to have vehicles that um, won't allow a signal. Well, I'm just saying that that kind of technology, that's, yeah. you know, I mean. That would be really extreme, and boy, I think there'd be so much opposition to that. I'm, I'm sure. Because we'd be taking a step back about 15 years Correct. or more. Correct, but know. I don't know, everybody thinks that, well, I'm okay. Um, you know, and again, I mean, I'm, when I, my phone first did all these things, uh, I'll admit, you know, I've had to coach myself into, you know, don't, don't do it. I mean, I yeah. have to drive back and forth a lot, and a lot of time there's not much traffic. But. Just, if you're going to have a law, Gordon, just make it, you got to be on hands-free. You know, some of the newer cars right. these days have um, uh, Bluetooth technology mm -hmm. built right into the car. And so, you know, you just punch up something on your steering wheel. We have a car like that where you just punch up the, this, uh, you know, button on the steering and wheel. And maybe the technical innovations that you'll see, um, you know, won't be the ones that ban it, but maybe enable it to be easier to address yeah. this. But yeah. um, it's, an, it's an issue. Yeah. Um, one thing that, that really sort of died um, was, and we'd heard a fair amount about it, was the, um, s the registered sex offender residency, mm -hmm. um, where the state was trying to basically do away with what several little communities throughout the state have put in, you know, they've put in their own residency requirements or restrictions. Um, for registered sex offenders and the state was trying to do away with those so that there'd be one uniform thing and that that ended up not passing what happened there um, you know politics happened yeah. I mean this is one and I know Algoma was one of the first communities to have one but um, one of the things we're seeing is you know how do we deal with um, people who are registered sex offenders who have served their time and are released into the community I mean it's one of the things families and parents you know worry about the most um, you know, the important thing we know from a protection standpoint is that we want to know where they are. Um, you know, we do a lot of GPS monitoring, those things. But a lot of communities have given that, passed these ordinances that, you know, ban them from the community and maybe that promotes a false sense of um, security. The problem is, as communities increasingly do this, there's a, a fewer places for them to go. And the members who had the bill uh, bipartisan from a variety of different areas. A lot of them were either from cities or from unincorporated rural areas, and that's about the only place that uh, they would be able to go if, if it continues like this. So it added additional measures about where sex offenders could or couldn't go, meaning they'd be prohibited to, from, to go to public places where there would be kids. Um, but at the same time, it eliminated the ordinances that you see. Um, I think there was a picture in the Northwestern a year ago or so of you know, two sex offenders with GPS bracelets laying under a bridge in, in Florida because they've been banned from everywhere yeah. that we don't even know where they are. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's something, an issue that's not going to go away, but certainly a lot of the communities that um, had taken action were opposed to it. Um, politically, it would be one of those issues that if it came up, you know, people would say you voted to allow sex offenders anywhere, when that's not really what it is, but it's what's the best way that we can realistically have a real sense of security by knowing where people are, um, by not you know, banishing them to places where we, we don't really know where they are, um, you know, and protect people uh, with a real measure, not something that provides sort of false security. Well, and, and I think you hit the nail on the head there, Gordon, because you, you look at the town of Algoma and, um, you know, you may have a, a law that says you can't live within our 
our you know little perimeters here but there's nothing to stop them from driving in parking across from a school going to a park uh, going to a library right. um, you know whatever and so it is all about a false sense of security and and they're just deluding themselves if they think that that is protecting their children in that right. community so now w do you think that th something like this will come back in the future um, probably because the issue is not going to go away and I think you still see you know different ordinances get taken up and of course for the communities that haven't acted or have decided to go in another way they carry the burden of a disproportionate number of them now I know I think we get notices when someone is um, back in the community um, that's the most important thing is we want to know where these people are you want to mm -hmm. be able to educate your neighborhood and your community um, you know, I'm assuming that this is the kind of thing that, that whoever represents different areas that are impacted are going to continue to good for, you know, go forward. But anytime you're sort of talking about these types of things, um, there's not a lot of public sympathy for where these people go or why. Right. Um, and, and that's what makes it difficult. But, uh, you know, we do need adults at the table to make realistic decisions that are based in fact and public safety and not just in you know, pandering to headlines. So, and and um, dealing with emotion. Yeah. Um, so if it comes back now, because I, I didn't get into the specifics or understand the specifics of, of how this last piece of legislation had been drafted and proposed, um, did it account for, you know, the different types of registered sex offenders so that you're not, you know, putting restrictions on, uh, you know, kids who maybe had um, you know, sex and, and they were underage, but yet it was, you know, they, they, it was a choice that they made. Um, they're not out there going at preying on little children, you know. I'm not sure, but I know that's going to be another thing that's going to need to be addressed. I mean, I know we yeah. feel differently about, um, you know, an 18 and a 16 year old getting together than we do. Um, you know, the worst kind of predator um, on a younger child or mm -hmm. something. Um, and the law hasn't really been built for those types of distinctions. I think the other thing is the majority of, you know, sex offenders are family members who have committed against another family member. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the things that uh, also, um, you know, are real violations, but I it's not the, you know, stranger rolling down the street. Um, so I think, you know, that's the other thing that you hope there's some judicial discretion in those situations. At the same time, we do draw the line for a reason, you know, you can't drink till you're 18, you can't, or 21, you can't uh, vote till you're 18, you know, and we, we debate those things. But uh, sure. in terms, especially when you're talking about kids becoming adults and, yep. and their right to make those decisions, we have to have some um, barrier in place. Sure. Well, and, and even, I mean, you, you reference like an 18 year old with a 16 year old girlfriend or boyfriend. Um, you know, you've even got kids who both both parties are under 18 and they're having consensual sex, but yet one or both can be, um, you know, convicted as uh, sex offenders and have to register. Um, so hopefully it, when it does come back, it, some, some things like that will be taken into account. Um, let's see, regional transit authorities, um, you know, that y there was a, a bill that was trying to establish those and that fell apart too and ended up dying. Um, any thoughts on that? You know, frustrating. I think a lot of it was waiting on what Southeastern Wisconsin wanted to decide both with regards to, uh, you know, we have a lot of areas that are trying to come up with, uh, you know, um, you know, ways to finance their uh, rail or bus system. Um, Milwaukee being the most complicated because you had some parts of southeastern Wisconsin with Kenosha, Racine, and Milwaukee that wanted it, some that didn't. I really sort of stayed out of it, but they couldn't reconcile the best way to set it up. A more concern to me was um, the Fox Valley Transit, which we did pass, but the Senate didn't. Um, the Fox Valley Area Transit is going to exceed 200,000 people uh, soon, and they're going to lose federal funding as a result. Most of our public transportation is subsidized. They, um, uh, you know, agreed to the business leaders, the communities involved to have a referendum in those communities to pass, um, you know, an optional tax if they wanted to, to finance it. And they may need this if the federal funding runs out. So without that, we're probably jeopardizing some of the future public um, transportation up there and we're going to have to address it in the future. So it was disappointing. Okay. And the uh, clean energy jobs bill, that also 
went down in flames too. Um, what what happened there? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like you know, just we pa when we passed you know payday loans, I was pretty excited. Unfortunately, some of the headlines about what didn't get passed, but these are issues that aren't going to go away. Both the regional transit issues will be back. Um, they are important on the clean energy jobs bill. Um, what we wanted was certainty. It's an economic uncertain time. Um, you know, I'm part of the from the part of the state where we have a lot of older industries, a lot of manufacturers that um, burn things. Um, at the same time, we have Renewagy in town. We have Orion. We have a lot of um, you know new manufacturers that are building um, really clean energy uh, you know products, and we're seeing China right now is producing a huge amount of the world's renewable uh, products and. Wisconsin as a manufacturing state has a huge opportunity um, to capture a part of this market, but we're not going to be able to do it, you know, if we don't sort of incentivize it. So we pay $16 billion a year for energy production that goes outside the state. And if we can, you know, encourage the kind of alternative production within the state, keep the money here, produce the energy here, use alternative resources, provide manufacturers, you have the opportunity to benefit the economy as well. Um, you know, I don't think there's any you know, doubt to that. Um, we already have a 10% renewable mandate that we're exceeding as a state, and that was through 2015. Um, uh, you know, the details of the bill, I know a lot of compromises were made to accommodate the paper industry, which I was happy about, you know, and some others. But um, this one got hit by politics, too, a little bit. Um, some focusing on the energy side and not on the economic side enough. but. Uh, we have to recognize this as an opportunity. Like I said, if, if people want to know how are we going to compete against the world, yeah. you know, when I hear that you know, China's economy is surging because they're the ones doing the supplying of this kind of manufacturing when we could be doing it, um, I think it's something we'll hopefully you know, come back to and, and, and get more buy-in from some of the businesses that may have opposed it. But there was, you know, some businesses were on board and you know, it was a real split, but I think, you know, people certainly need to be comfortable. No one wanted to introduce uncertainty into the economy. Sure. We've only got about a minute and a half left, Gordon, but um, one of the things, too, that the Democrats were really um, pushing for was a voter registration bill, and that failed also. That that went nowhere. So, um, you know, that, I'm assuming, will probably be seen again in the future? I think so. Uh, at least, you know, people were focusing on some of the things they didn't like. There certainly was an effort to increase access to the ballot, to remove some of the barriers, but also to, um, you know, help out our clerks by, you know, making it easier for people uh, to vote early and to count those ballots in the same way. Um, also to have more accountability and modernize our election systems. I think we all realize the security of our elections and the risk um, is really uh, you know, we need to have a, a you know, modern election system where um, we expand opportunity b maybe by, um, you know, allowing some of our military members to utilize a secure internet site. Um, you know, some of the things that were in there that we're trying to increase turnout, I guess, some people that are disenfranchised, you know, like military members. So that one probably ran out of time as well. A lot of legislation like we've seen gets introduced, takes a couple sessions to get done. and. And that may have been the case. All right. Well, we'll be seeing a lot of these things probably coming back before us. So <laughs> there's another session right, right around the corner. When does the next session start? Um, not, for, not for a while. Um, we're sort of in the, uh, not until after the election. Okay. So um, now I'm busy uh, s talking about a lot of the things we did and making sure businesses and others know a lot of the things that we did on economic development and job creation and making sure people know how to utilize uh, some of the programs we that are passed. Okay. All right, very good. Well, thanks much for being here. We appreciate it as always. Thank you. We'll be having you back again. Okay. <laughs> All right, very good. That's going to do it for us. We'll see you next time. Until then, take care. Keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh. <laughs>